one point you just mentioned is important, and this can occasionally get lost as these conversations go on, and that is it's a switching back and forth intermittently is important. Um, the number, for example, in the muscle cells with exercise, the number of mitochondria doesn't increase during the exercise. It, actually, it increases during the rest period. But if you had never exercised, you would have never gotten the stimulus that triggers what's called mitochondrial biogenesis, the increase in the number of mitochondria. So there's switching back and forth be, between the metabolic challenge, whether it's fasting or exercise, and the recovery, whether, you know, eating, resting, sleeping. You know, so, and there's definitely a limit to all of this. Obviously, with fasting, starvation, if you, you know, if you start to lose muscle mass, then you're, you're fasting too much. Um, and as you mentioned, you can overdo it with exercise, too, and sometimes get diminishing returns. So it's important to have these recovery periods. You've you've ta- you've talked about the the, re- the importance of what are you know called the refeeding phase. Um, both you know you and Dr. Walter Longa have discussed this in, in publications, and um, Walter on the podcast previously. And I, it's a really, like you mentioned, it's a point that a lot of you know people don't focus on that recovery period. How how important, like you know, for the for the refeeding period, um, you know. How important is that, and how long is that window? Do we know? You know, is it like uh, a week? Is it just a couple of days? Well, with these these intermittent fasting eating patterns I'm talking about are kind of trivial from an evolutionary perspective. That is, limiting the time window you eat to six to eight hours each day. Um, you know that the remaining, whatever, 18, 16 to 18 hours is more than sufficient to recover. You know, if you, if you fasted for, if you tried to do fasting for five days, one day recovery, fast another five days, one day recovery, and keep that up, it won't be long before you're going to start to have problems. So, and it's the same with exercise. It's, um, there's, you know, my understanding is there's quite a few ultra marathoners who, when they get in their fifties and sixties, start to have a lot of problems. So there, you know, there could be some, you know, long-term consequences of overdoing it, whether it's with fasting or exercise. And what you and I are talking about today is well within any you know, any bounds of even getting close to having adverse effects and having to worry about, am I recovering or not? But perhaps more of a, of a someone doing a more of a prolonged fast um, might have to consider, you know, the refeeding and, and how important. Yeah. I know. There's a, in Europe, for example, in Germany, there are clinics where, People go in for a couple of weeks and they'll fast for 10 days to two weeks under, you know, supervised. It's kind of like a resort, actually, you know, and everybody else there is doing the same thing. And they're, they've, they're collecting a lot of data and starting to publish. And uh, but what, they see a lot of improvements in health indicators, even within that, you know, two, two week fasting period. But they don't have really good data on long-term effects. And in talking to the the people who run these centers, um, oftentimes a a, a person will only do this once a year. And so they may be overweight and, you know, have insulin resistance and they'll go in and they'll show some even during that short period, a little bit of improvement in their 
insulin sensitivity, but then they'll come back a year later and they're back where they were or worse. So, um, you know, one question then is if someone wants to fast for longer time periods, what frequency would be reasonable for long-term health? You've interviewed Walter Longo before, and he's done a lot of work with this uh, eating pattern where the subjects, um, five consecutive days a month, they'll eat only one moderate size meal, and then the other days of the month eat normally, and that seems to be beneficial. Um, the key thing is, you know, how long can people maintain this in in their lifestyle, incorporated into their lifestyle? And you know, daily time restricted eating, for example, seems to be easy for a lot of people to do for years and years and years. You know, maybe five days a month, that perhaps. But at some point, you have to think about it that way looking kind of a long view of, of what can you, and then another thing is what about, you know, so daily time restricted eating, if you skip breakfast, then you can still have lunch with people at work uh, and dinner with people. Whereas a, if you're doing something else, maybe like falters, maybe five days a month, you're not going to be able to, you may go out to dinner with somebody and say, well, I can't eat anything today. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. Right. 